good crowd. And you came without us even promising a lunch, right? Coffee. That reminds me, we used to say when, uh, when Earl Warren was the chief, that he would go anywhere if you provided a sandwich. So, so we took him out to lunch with great frequency. But there is coffee outside, so <laughs> well, at least we provide that. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's program with novelist and legal scholar Garrett Epps. Uh, today, Garrett will take us inside his superb book, American Epic, Reading the U.S. Constitution, a book publishers weekly described as an intelligent and provocative tour through the fascinatingly complicated, vitally important blueprint of the United States. It's a terrific book. Lyle, in fact, he emailed me months ago and he said, you must get Garrett. It's a fantastic book. So we did, and you can now buy his book in the museum store, which is in the main lobby, and there will be a book sale and signing right after the program. Garrett Epps is a professor of law at the University of Baltimore School of Law, where he teaches constitutional law and creative writing. Garrett's published numerous books and articles in the field of constitutional law and creative writing. He is a novelist and former journalist and was a staff writer for the Washington Post and has also written for the New York Times, <coughs> the New Republic, and the New York Review of Books. He's a frequent contributor to theatlantic.com. Moderating today's conversation is a very dear friend, Lyle Dennison, he's a veteran Supreme Court reporter. He's uh, the center's advisor for constitutional literacy. He's reported on the Supreme Court for more than 50 years. And you can find him on SCOTUS blog, and we're lucky he's on our blog, Constitution Daily. He's the author of The Reporter and the Law, Techniques of Covering the Courts. He also contributed two chapters to 100 Americans Making Constitutional History. I'm very pleased Lyle could join us today. Uh, for those of you who have been present at one or more of our town, town hall events this year or even this week, because we have four, uh, you know it's been an incredibly busy and exciting fall. Um, we still have more, though. We have a program <coughs> tomorrow night with Governor Scott Walker. Uh, we have, after Thanksgiving, Governor Bobby Jindal on December 3rd, and then on December 10th at noon is our final town, town hall pr uh, Tuesday of the year. And then we're starting up January 6th with an unbelievable number of programs. So keep coming back. Um, we want to thank our members and our 1787 Society donors who have joined us today. If you have questions or would like to know more about 1787 Society, including the exclusive events, free admission to our events, and free books, and a lot more, you can see Lori Rosard, who's in the back of the room. And if you're not a member, you, you can be one, uh, pick up a brochure, which I think is on your seat, or you can go to the membership desk on your way out. We, we would love to have your support. Um, now, a few quick housekeeping items. <coughs> Later in the conversation, we're going to do audience questions, so if you pick up the note card on your chair and jot a question down, I'll come through a couple times and pick up your cards and bring them to Lyle. And please, please turn off your cell phones. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Lyle Denniston and Garrett Epps. Um, can you move this one between us? Between us. Oh, sure. This one. Um, good morning. Um, Good afternoon. Uh, <clears throat> when I was in the uh, high school choir <clears throat> in Nebraska, City, Nebraska, a few years ago, every now and then the director would stop and say, let's try it again without Lyle. Um, I, I was not born with a singing voice, and in my uh, um, 80th uh, plus years, um, I'm losing whatever voice I had for public speaking, so forgive me if I sound like I'm... Uh, coming from uh, New Jersey. Um, and I don't mean the accent, uh, I mean the distance. Um, it is always a pleasure for me to come back to the center, but it's a particular pleasure to be here today with Garrett. I don't want to embarrass Garrett too much. Um, but Garrett, uh, Garrett is a very, very unique fellow. Um, we have had from time to time on the court meet um, reporters who brought something new to the beat. For example, in, in the 1950s, Tony Lewis of the Times, and Tony who unfortunately died last May, uh, and pioneered coverage of the court for the news media, really set the standard on high quality Supreme Court journalism. Um, and then his tradition was continued by uh, Linda Greenhouse, who covered the court for the Times for 30 years. Um, and was really, really considered to be uh, the reporter <coughs> who covered the court <coughs> from the perspective of the judges and the lawyers. In other words, she was very interested in the law 
uh, law as a discipline. Um, fairly recently, we've got a new reporter on the beat who covers it from the perspective of humor, Dahlia Lithwick of Slate Magazine, who is an absolutely delightful <coughs> person. Uh, if you've never seen her uh, on the public stage, you must find some venue where she appears because she's absolutely delectable. What Garrett has now brought to the beat um, is essentially that of uh, the perspective of a Renaissance man. Um, Garrett is a novelist. Um, he's had biblical training. Sermon, is there, you've been to the seminary? No, no, just to Christian that? school. Christian, Christian school. school, okay. <laughs> Um, but Garrett approaches the beat from the perspective of, of not a legal analyst. Um, the tight strictures of legal logic um, are something that don't, doesn't, don't really fascinate him. Garrett looks at the law from a much larger cultural and social and intellectual perspective, and you will find that out this afternoon as we talk. Um, but also, he is, he is, his, his work for Atlantic.com uh, um, is really singularly um, original and creative. Uh, so it is a really distinct pleasure for me to have uh, Garrett with me today. Um, and um, with, we're, we're going to have a conversation which we hope you will join in with your questions later. But let, let me start with a few quotes from the book. Um, which I think will, will set the stage. Uh, Garrett writes early in the book, it sometimes seems that Americans worship the Constitution so deeply that they find its actual text a distraction. <laughs> we have little interest in what the Constitution says, but we are obsessed with what it means. And later on in the book, there is this quotation. When we try to understand the Constitution, the words are all we have, and the words themselves are very seldom clear. So, Garrett, let's get started here with Great. the conversation about uh, elsewhere in the book. You mentioned that 10% of the original content of the Constitution has been displaced or become repealed, outworn. Yeah. So, uh, what is this sacred document that we're looking at, <laughs> and what is the value of people being able to understand it? Well, uh, Lyle, I don't know if you saw an item in the, the Onion, the satirical website, a few years ago that had a headline, uh, Area Man, Passionate Defender of What He Imagines Constitution to Say. Um, and it says, uh, you know, that describes this uh, local figure as, uh, as honoring the legions of brave men who have died for ideas that exist only in his head. Uh, and I, I think that that is a, a, a problem that, that people have. Uh, that we, we have a lot of constitutionoid ideas, constitutional-ish. Uh, and some of them come from uh, the Articles of Confederation. Some of them come from the Declaration of Independence. Uh, some of them come from sources that, that really are just random sources in American history. And that we, we honor them and think of them as being in the Constitution. If you read the Constitution, you just sit down and read it, uh, you, the, the reason people stop is that basically what you encounter is a set of rules. Here's how to run your government. It's like, boring, you know, I want to know, you know, I want to know, you know, the Da Vinci Code. I want to know, you know, did Jesus die on the cross? I want to know the secret thoughts of George Washington. Um, and so what's, what's the first thing that I think is striking when you read the Constitution is uh, what's not in it the extent to which substantive values, you know, that we, the America must not have a health care system. None of those things are there. There are rules by which we can enact uh, the laws that we think are appropriate. And there are not a whole lot of values, um, including equality. Equality doesn't appear in the Constitution until the 14th Amendment. It wasn't originally there. Uh, a lot of things like that, um, that, that, just, that just aren't there. And once you let yourself see what really is there, I think you get a much different perspective on how American government ought to operate. Well, and, and what is the value of folks like these wonderful people here undertaking to pick up the Constitution and read it from 
We the People Through the 27th Amendment. Well, you know, the title of the book is American Epic, and you asked me, uh, you know, before I came up, you know, what, what, what is that all about? Um, and I, I thought about it uh, on the way up here. Um, an epic is really, if you think about the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid, uh, the epics are these, these, what I would call constitutive poems of these cultures. Greece really took its sense of what its society was from the Iliad and the Odyssey. Um, and these were works that were constructed over a period of time uh, using sort of similar formulas, but many different hands. You know, we, we no longer believe there was one blind genius named Homer who just one day came out and said, you know, I've got this great idea. It's a 5,000 word poem, 5,000 line poem. Um, it was built up over a long time uh, to explain what it meant to live in that part of the world in that time, to be a citizen of one of the Greek city-states. And I think that is really what the Constitution is if you read it as a whole. Because, I mean, we're in the, we're in, uh, the National Constitution Center. We honor the place where the original document was written. Um, but it actually has been written over many, many, many years by many, many hands up to and including, uh, you know, the people that wrote the 25th and 26th Amendments, some of whom are still living. Uh, and to see the way in which America's sense of its own identity changes, beginning with the, the 1787 Constitution, then the 10, uh, what we call the Bill of Rights, then the Civil War Amendments, then coming forward through the Progressive Amendments, and then amendments that were written during the 60s. I think, for example, the 25th Amendment is one of the most moving documents to me of what it was like to be alive during the Cold War. This, it's the second lar longest amendment in the Constitution. This, that is the That's amendment. presidential succession. What happens if the president goes crazy? What happens if the president and vice president both die? Um, and this came along in the mid-60s when people, we had, we had just had an assassination. It was the period of the Manchurian candidate and, and fail-safe and terror that, that, uh, that something horrible would happen with no notice and how would the country keep going? And you read the language that's used, which be begin it starts off sounding just like 1787, but it isn't. It's much more anxious, much more, much more lawyerly, much more anxious to kind of cover every uh, uh, possibility. Um, and it, it, it really is an interesting memory of what that time was like. We don't worry quite so much now. About so now, is, is the language of that amendment epic? I, it's much more lawyerly. It it's is more, lawyerly. more, you know, it is written. You know, one of the things about the 1787 Constitution, it was written by a lot of lawyers. Uh, I regret to say the only law professor who was uh, at the convention had to leave early. Otherwise, it would obviously be a much better uh, that was. document. George George Wythe had to go back. George His wife Wythe. became ill, and he had to return to uh, to, to Virginia. But. Um, it was written by, by a lot of lawyers, but that was at a time when being a lawyer meant something quite different. Lawyers didn't spend most of their time reading complicated statutes. You know, you and I sit through these cases in front of the court where we're discussing the securities litigation uniform something, and they say, well, Section 307A2 is enacted in, against a background of 307A3, and this is what lawyers do now. They, they didn't really do that kind of reading and writing in the 18th century. The people that wrote the 25th Amendment are statutory lawyers, and they are trying desperately to control every constituency, the, I mean every uh, contingency. That's clearly not happening in the Constitution. There's all kinds of things they left out. Mm -hmm. Well, now, if, if we leave the meaning and understanding mm -hmm. of the Constitution to lawyers and legal academics, does that deserve the Constitution and its public function? Oh, I think so. I, I do. I think that, um, you know, this is, America, I think, still is the only, and certainly we were the first country in the world where our leaders and our soldiers and public servants don't take an oath to the king. Uh, we take an oath to a document. We take an oath to the Constitution. That is the center of our American life. And I think that um, Americans need to understand the Constitution, and they need to understand it in ways other than purely lawyer ways. Mm -hmm. Lawyers, of course, uh, you know, W.H. Auden said, law, say the gardeners, is the sun. You know, each of us sees the law as being what we're good at. 
And lawyers see the law and the Constitution as being about courts and judges. Uh, it really isn't. Huge, huge chunks of the Constitution will never, ever give rise to litigation. We have to live by them because we all agree to live under a certain system of law. Um, uh, example would be, did President Obama need to go to Congress in order to get authorization uh, to attack Syria? Or should he have gone to Congress to get authorization uh, to in involve the United States in Libya? Neither of these is ever going to be ruled on by a court, but they're terribly important. War and peace, life and death of the Republic. And if ordinary people, you can't just sort of open the Constitution and look at you know, the one part of the Constitution that says Congress shall have the power to declare war. It needs to be read as a whole to really understand you know, how that system is set up to work. Well, now, the, the subtitle of your book is Reading the U.S. Constitution. Yes. And we've now just briefly mentioned lawyer, the way lawyers read mm -hmm. it. Your book also says it can be read in an epic yes. mode. It can be read in a biblical mode, mm -hmm. uh, a lyric mode. Yes. What does what do those approaches to reading? Well, let's mean? start with lyric because I think um, uh, we're all familiar with with lyric poetry. We all get some exposure to it in our education. And I always, when I was young, I wanted to be a poet, and I thought poets got girls. Um, <laughs> and I am unable to testify whether that's true or not. But uh, uh, I have published a poem as an adult oh, in, yeah. in, a, in a journal. So, um, but uh, if you look at uh, the example I use in the book is a poem by Emily Dickinson, which was written in 1865, you know, at a moment of great constitutional um, turmoil, uh, in which she, she says, Revolution is the pod systems rattle from. When the winds of will are stirred, excellent is bloom. And this, you know, that's maybe 20 words that contain so many images and ideas. Social revolution is made into a seed pod at the end of the at the end of the growing season that's being blown the 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 actions the will of individual people is turned into the wind that blows the seed pod and, and creates new life and of course that evokes an image from the gospels where uh, uh, Jesus explains the holy spirit by saying who has seen the wind to to show that that invisible forces can shape our world so it's a very rich one stanza of poetry. It's about the same length as this poem, which I will now quote to you, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. If you try to read that as a statute, you're going to get nowhere. You know, literally as just a denotative rule, it is spectacularly unhelpful. Uh, you just can't figure out what it says. And it is really helpful to expose yourself a little bit to the lyric sensibility um, and say, well, what images? What are the images that these words evoke? Well, we have militia, and we have uh, uh, free state. And then we have the concept of regulation, uh, necessity. We have keep and bear arms. All of these things, if you view them as images, um, they don't necessarily get you closer to the meaning, but they really do stir up some thoughts about what is the purpose of the, what is the, the role of the right to keep and bear arms in American history. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, Which, of course, changed in 2008. Yes, it certainly did, didn't it? Um, though they were just discovering the <laughs> original intent, it turned out. Um, you know, original intent, I, I think I say this in the book, uh, I, I lived in the Pacific Northwest for 16 years, and original intent to me is like Sasquatch was out there. You, know, so you always know someone whose cousin saw it, right? He did, it was right there, but you yourself never quite can find it. Right. Well, uh, let's, let's turn to some of the text. By the way, I think you, it will already be apparent to mm -hmm. you that Garrett's book is not a legal commentary. <laughs> no. This is not a Supreme Court case book. Mm -hmm. If you're looking uh, uh, to, to find um, a hard lawyer's analysis of Marbury, for example, or District of Columbia versus Heller, you won't find it in this book. Mm -hmm. well, you will find lyric poetry. You will find epic statement. Uh, 
you will find even biblical references. Absolutely. And, and can you recall right now one of the biblical references? Well, uh, that or actually is something... A biblical motive. Yeah, right? sure. But that, you know, that, that one of the things we all know and believe is that uh, we have the Bill of Rights, and the Bill of Rights are Ten Commandments, right? Uh, ten. Now, that's a bizarre coincidence, but it really isn't... I mean, in fact, Madison proposed 13 original amendments, of which two were never ratified, and one only made it into the Constitution in 1992, which is another bizarre story. But originally, uh, throughout the first century or so of American history, the Bill of Rights was considered to be the first eight amendments. And gradually, as, as they take on this kind of sacred aura, 10 seem to make much more sense. So you jam the ninth and 10th in there, which really are not about individual rights. But you can see why people think of them as the Ten Commandments. They have this kind of thou shalt not language. Congress shall make no law. And to us, if you've been brought up on the Bible, that kind of injunction signals you are in the presence of the sacred. You know, this is something you don't do, right? Thou shalt not kill. Um, the, uh, the number is not accidental. It is, it is taken on this mythological form. And it always reminds me of that scene in uh, History of the World Part One by Mel Brooks, where he comes down. He, Mel Brooks plays Moses because he's the director. He gets to play Moses. And he comes down from the, and he's got three tablets. And he says, uh, the Lord, the Lord Jehovah has given us these 15. And then one of the stone tablets falls, you know, and breaks. And he goes, oi, 10, 10 commandments for all to follow. And, and sort of, you know, the, the, the magicalness of 10, you know, uh, is, is one reason that the Bill of Rights is so important uh, to people. Well, now, the, um, the 13th Amendment, you yes. discussed that mm -hmm. in your book. Tell us how you perceive that was really a seminal beginning of something new. The 13th Amendment is, is really fascinating to read because it makes a statement that appears almost nowhere else in the Constitution. I can't think of any similar statement. Uh, and that is slavery, uh, save as uh, punishment for crime whereof the party shall be duly convicted, uh, shall not exist in the United States or anywhere subject to its jurisdiction. Um, and that's not the same if you wrote, if you were drafting it to sound like the other amendments, you'd say, Congress shall make no law permitting slavery, no state shall permit persons to be held in slavery. This is much broader. It is extremely radical. You know, it creates a private right against other private persons. You may not hold me as a slave. I don't need the, you know, I don't need to prove state action. I don't need to, to involve the government. And interestingly enough, it links up to only one other place in the Constitution where a private right was created, and it actually canceled that out, and that is the Fugitive Slave Clause. Because in the original Constitution, the Fugitive Slave Clause gave the owner of human property the right to demand the delivery of a fugitive slave. It was a private right. That is obviously canceled when you abolish slavery, and instead we have this private right now to proceed against anyone who tries to hold you as a slave. It is, it is extremely radical in its, in its uh, uh, language. Um, the Constitution doesn't talk in existential terms most of the time. And also, and this was a revelation to me, though yeah. I've been reading the Constitution mm -hmm. and writing about it for a long time, mm -hmm. that the 13th Amendment really is the core of the due process idea. Yes. Rather than the 14th, where due process has as you may know, if you know modern civil liberties law, the due process clause of the 14th Amendment is the clause through which the courts have brought in against the states the prohibitions of the Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. For example, in 2011, the Supreme Court ruled that the Second Amendment right to have a gun does apply to state and local governments. And they said that in 2011, three years after finding that there was a Second Amendment personal right. right to have a gun. But normally, most of us think that either the due process clause or the liberty word mm -hmm. in the 14th Amendment is the fount of modern due process, and therefore modern civil liberties development. Mm -hmm. But you found it already in the 13th. It, the 13th Amendment says 
slavery or involuntary servitude save as punishment for crime of which the party shall have been duly convicted. And that is the first time in the Constitution that any idea of due process applies to the states. And it's not, I don't think, random. Because one of the concerns that, was, that people had during and after the Civil War was that after the war, the former slave states, if you abolished slavery, the former slave states would create a system, which was actually done in a number of places, where uh, black Americans would be convicted of vagrancy, of loitering, and would be put to hard labor, and their contracts were, were going to be auctioned off to individuals so that you would end up owning another human being, but it would be for conviction for crime. And so here's this little idea. No, it has to be a due conviction. You can't just sort of say we're convicting everybody. Um, and uh, that has become actually you know, fairly powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and then subsequently, of course, the due process clause of the 14th Amendment spreads the idea very explicitly to a wide area of things that have nothing to do with slavery. By the way, um, after you've finished reading uh, uh, American Epic, um, you must also uh, find and read uh, Garrett's book, Democracy Reborn, Democracy Reborn yeah. uh, which is the story of the enactment uh, uh, and ratification of the 14th Amendment. It is a superb piece of American history. So uh, Democracy Reborn is, is is as good as American yeah, epic. Thank you. So, so. Yeah. Um, let's talk to, look to some of the other textual mm -hmm. materials. Mm -hmm. Article one doesn't say anything at all about checks and balances, mm -hmm. but we assume that it's there. Um, Correct. Where did it come from, and how does it get in? Well, it's Article fascinating one? because you know my students will say to me, you know, in the early classes, I'll say, why do you think this? And they'll say, well, as you know, we have a system of separation of powers and checks and balances which is sort of like saying, you know, we have a system of uh, jumbo shrimp. I mean, the two ideas are completely contradictory. <laughs> and neither one of them, neither one of them is in the Constitution. Um, we, don't, there, we don't have a term anywhere for separation of powers. We don't have a term anywhere for checks and balances. People tend to describe the Constitution as containing ways in which the different branches, and that's a term that also doesn't appear in the Constitution, check each other or balance out each other. Um, and I, I did a little research, um, and I actually found out that that term, as far as we can tell, was first used by John Adams in his book, Defense of the Constitutions of, uh, what's the full title, Defense of the Constitution of Massachusetts? Of and, the colony. Of the colony, yeah. yeah. Uh, and when, and he, but it comes from British Whig thought, with the idea that no part of government no part of government should get too strong and that other, uh, other parts uh, of government should be given the power to block or check it. And if you think about the origins of the metaphor, <coughs> checks and balances, it actually comes from the kind of Newtonian view of how things work. Clockworks, wind up machines, have checks and balances. When when the flywheel gets too high, it runs into a little thing that blocks it, then it drops back down and the counterweight falls and the whole thing starts again. I don't know how many people have been to Monticello, but uh, Jefferson had that wonderful clock that told you what day it was, except he did the math wrong, so he had to cut a hole in the floor so that the weight could go through to Saturday. But that's a, a classic check and balance. You know, when it reached a certain point, there would be a thing to block it, then it would drop back down, then it would, fall, it would, it would come up again. And so it's this image of the Constitution as a machine uh, that will run on its own, and when one part of it gets too far, it'll be checked, and then it'll fall back in place. Um, and the idea of having one branch of government check the others is antithetical to separation of powers. That's the complete opposite of separation of powers. Separation of powers meant that no branch of government can interact with any of the others. So if you want to see separation, it's a French idea. If you want to see it, go to France. Because in France, for example, the regular law courts, being part of the judicial power, cannot assess the legality of action by the executive branch. They have to have their own courts. You know, Congress, the, 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 the legislature can take no part in the conduct of the executive. In our system, all of these things are all wound together, that the executive has a veto. You know, Congress can override the veto. 
Um, the courts are very much enmeshed. The chief justice per participates in, in uh, impeachment of the president. Um, that, and so I prefer in the book, I say, maybe we should, if we thought of it as the web of powers, right, if we saw it as a web or tapestry, so that the question becomes, you know, if you cut this thread, does the whole thing fall apart? We might have a better sense of what was really going on. Mm -hmm. Now, you said it originates in Whig thought. Whig thought, yeah, um, late 17th century. Early and that 18th. was against the crown. Exactly. That uh, the, we should not have all power concentrated in the chief magistrate. Exactly. The Whigs wanted Parliament to be, to be stronger right. to be able to check the king. Well, let's move on briefly then to Article 2. Um, mm -hmm. In the book, you say that Article 2 is cryptic and incomplete. Yes. First of all, what do you mean by that, and what implications does it have for us understanding the scope and breadth of the president's power? Well, Article 2 is a wonderful, wonderful little text that you can spend, you know, if you're a nerd like me, you can spend <coughs> years thinking about. Um, and let's start with um, the idea that, that it demonstrates to us that biblical reading is often wrong. Because to Americans, when we read something like the Bible, to Americans, our sensibility shaped so much by the Protestant Reformation is that the Bible is complete, it contains no mistakes, it contains no contradictions, it tells everything that we need to know. That's the theological idea of the Bible that emerges from the Reformation. I think Article 2 makes utterly clear that that cannot be true of the Constitution that it is incomplete, and we know that because within two or three years of the beginning of the New Republic, Congress was convulsed by a controversy that involved many of the original framers over whether the president could fire members of the cabinet. There is no mention of removal in Article 2. The president can appoint, Congress approves, and then it just says nothing about uh, about whether he can remove or not. And Madison, uh, Madison's position, which was that the president could remove, eventually triumphed. But he was very strongly uh, contested in the first Congress by people who said, oh no, that, uh, that silence obviously means members of the cabinet serve for life, like judges, and cannot be dismissed. Um, and other people said, no, the president can dismiss, but only with the permission of the Senate, because it uh, took the Senate to approve a member of the cabinet. And finally, Madison says, you know, look, let's just, we can argue about this for 100 years, let's just call it. And so they, they, they passed a resolution saying the president could dismiss executive officers, which of course now we take for granted. And it's just <coughs> clear to me that they just forgot to put it in, right? It wasn't like, you know, let's, let's put in a little ambiguity here. This will keep people involved later. Yes, excellent idea. <laughs> I, I just think they forgot. You know, they were busy doing other stuff. And all of Article 2 is just radically underwritten. And I think you can sympathize with what they were doing because they were trying to do something that had never been done before. One of the really radical innovations uh, in the Constitution is the idea of a head of state that is elected and subject to the law. You know, the king, kingship was the model of the head of state that they were dealing with. And they were like, well, we don't want that, so what do we want? And they didn't really know. They didn't know how it would work. And so they said, well, we'll put a few things in. Um, and then within, within, you know, as I say, within 10 years, this enormous debate had broken out about how to read it, uh, and, and not just the removal power, but the whole dispute between Adams and Madison, I mean between Hamilton and Madison, where Hamilton said, well, the, the, there's so little in this article that it clearly means the president has every power that isn't specifically denied to him, which is an extraordinary way to read it. And, Ham and Madison saying, no, no, the president has only those specific powers that he's given, which would also be the wrong way to read it. And those two things continue, those same two views, but it had in the George W. Bush administration where the, the Bush's Office of Legal Counsel said, as Hamilton made clear, the president has the power to attack any country he wants. There is no need for a congressional declaration of war. It's precisely the same argument going on now because Article 2 is written. It's so sketchy. It's just a sketch. It's like notes. Is the, is the article dealing with the judiciary, Article 3, similarly deficient in the text? Well, it, it's de I think it's consciously deficient 
uh, Lyle, because they, they couldn't agree whether they wanted a system of federal courts or not. They knew they had to have a Supreme Court because that was one of the real problems under the Articles. There was, there was no federal Supreme Court, and if two states got into a dispute, there was this elaborate <coughs> dispute resolution where one person would appoint you know, one arbitrator and the other state would appoint another, and then Congress would appoint a third. Um, and and they, they knew they wanted this Constitution to be a source of law, so they needed a final word on law. So it says, the judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court, and then it says, and such inferior courts as Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. And meaning, they don't have to be any. They don't have to be any federal courts other than the Supreme Court. Um, and, uh, or on the other hand, we could have what we have now, which is a very elaborate system of, of judges who, who serve for life. Um, and so nobody quite knew how the judicial power would operate. Um, and it is, it is certainly true that if they meant the courts to have the power of judicial review that they now have, the extensive power of judicial review that courts have in our country today, they sure did forget to say so in Article Three, didn't they? It's, uh, well, now, the, the word, the phrase, judicial review, appears nowhere in nowhere, Article Three. Nowhere in Article Three. So was John Marshall off base in reading that into the Constitution? Well, I, I th it's, it's, the question's really complicated. I think that Article 6 and the Supremacy Clause really suggest very strongly that federal courts and state courts should look at state laws to make sure they don't uh, contravene the Constitution. That, that one of the overwhelming concerns of the drafters of the original Constitution was to keep the states in check. Not to, not to protect states' rights, but to check them. And so Article 6, Section 2 says, you know, this Constitution, laws made in pursuance uh, thereof, and treaties made, or it shall be made under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land, anything in the law or Constitution of any state to the contrary notwithstanding, and judges in every state shall be bound on oath to enforce this Constitution. That's kind of a hint, right, to judges that they ought to be looking at state laws. Now, judicial review of federal law, it's, he didn't make it up out of whole cloth, but it's kind of a stretch from the text. There had been discussions about it. You can see references to it in Philadelphia. You can see references to it in the, in the uh, ratification debates. But they sure didn't nail it down. They kind of left it floating around there. Well, now, um, there is, as you well know, a mm. theory of departmental interpretation mm. that, right. that any branch of the federal government has the ultimate authority to interpret the Constitution, at mm -hmm. least as it applies to the powers conferred on that branch. That's right. Is that in the Constitution, alternatively to judicial supremacy? Um, well, only inferentially, and only in the sense that uh, executive officers are, take an oath to the Constitution, and the president takes the oath to uh, defend the Constitution, which is spelled out, you know, specifically. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and then has the authority to, to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. Um, the judiciary is not, there, there's very little language in the Constitution suggesting the judiciary should be telling the other branches what to do. It seems to be aimed mostly at, you know, ordinary legal disputes between mm -hmm. private parties or between the government and individuals. Well, well we made a passing reference or few to mm -hmm. the... Uh, a couple of the amendments. Let's turn to the amendments conceptually. Do you read, should we read the Constitution's amendments in any fashion differently than we read the body of the original text? Well, the Constitution itself says no. It says, it says on, in Article 5 that amendments shall be for all intents and purposes part of this Constitution. It explicitly says that amendments are to be regarded as equal. And of course, one of the interesting little historical facts is that when Madison introduced the first, what he thought would be the first 13 amendments, uh, he assumed that when you amended the Constitution, you would go in and change the words, and you would cross out the words you'd changed mm -hmm. and so forth. And so that at the end of this process, he assumed we would have basically a Constitution that read quite differently because the First Amendment would go in Article 1, uh, Section uh, 10, or Section 9, the limits on Congress and so forth. But uh, Congress, for whatever reason, the records are not very complete, 
decided they would just put them at the end. And so we have get this implicit message that they're not, you know, as good as. Um, and I talk about uh, a really actually wonderful essay by uh, E.L. E. Doctorow, the American um, novelist who read the Constitution and just at the end of it he just said, I can't stand this, this is really boring, I hate it. It's 40, he says it is 5,000 words but reads like 50,000. Well, the truth is the Constitution is 7,500 words and, and even Ed Doctorow somehow thinks the amendments don't count. And we suffer, I think, legally from that. I mean, to the extent that the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments are really central Mm -hmm. to what it means to live in a democratic country, um, the courts and, and ordinary citizens tend to undervalue those, those values of due process, the value of the, of the vote, uh, because they're not in the original Constitution. And I think that is really, um, it's really harmful. Right. Well, in a minute we want to start going through your questions, um, but, but let me ask you about mm -hmm. this strange phenomenon, the 27th Amendment, <laughs> um, enacted, um, proposed by uh, Madison, Madison as one of the original yeah. 13, mm -hmm. and not put into the Constitution until, what, 120 yeah. something? 1992. Um, why is it there? Um, did it do damage to the Constitution in what it does? Do? Well, you know, what's interesting, that's the amendment that says no law varying the compensation of, of senators or representatives shall take effect until after the next election for representatives. So Congress votes itself a pay raise and then has to go and, uh, and, and stand for re-election before it can collect any of the money. Uh, Madison proposed that. He thought it was a kind of housekeeping, good government type thing. Um, Congress approved it, but uh, the, for whatever reason, this didn't get enough legislative ratifications. Well, you go forward, and of course, in America, we have periodic uh, revulsions at Congress. This is not, what we're experiencing at this moment is not new. Uh, was a little more intense, perhaps. Yeah, well, pretty intense, but there have been worse, yeah. actually. Yeah, actually. And Mark Twain once said, you know, gentle reader, suppose you're a member of Congress, and suppose you're an idiot, but I repeat myself. <laughs> um, so you can see that the attitude's not near. And every now and then when people would get really mad, some legislature somewhere would say, we'll show them in Washington, we'll ratify this unratified amendment. So gradually it began to over 200 years, uh, come up with a bunch of ratifications. Well, in the late 1980s, two things happened. One was you had the House Bank scandal. Some of you who are close to my age will remember that people got furious because members of the House had their own bank that would cover their checks even if they didn't have enough money. Uh, and of course, this being a time of recession when a lot of us were not getting our checks covered, it made people very angry. At the same time, there was a kid in Texas, a, a college senior, who was looking for a senior, uh, senior project for his college, uh, and he found this amendment, and he wrote a little paper saying how this amendment could be ratified you know, if we just got f three or four more legislatures. Well, he got a very bad grade from his professor, who said, this is the stupidest idea I've ever heard of. Of course, that couldn't happen. And he went public with it. A House bank scandal had just hit. And bing, bing, bing. I think Nebraska was the final legislature to, to ratify. And then it comes to... Um, it, it, it is sent, you know, by uh, Nebraska to uh, Washington. And under our system of laws now, the decision of whether to include something in the Constitution is made by, of all people, the archivist of the United States. <laughs> and Senator Robert Byrd, who was a, a great, very strange, ambiguous force, uh, <laughs> uh, but had a great deal of reverence for the Constitution. In fact, he proposed America's least constitutional holiday, Constitution Day, uh, but which completely violates the First Amendment, but that's a different story. But he got very concerned. He said, this is not an appropriate way to amend the Constitution. This was proposed 200 years ago. We have a case, Dillon versus Gloss, in which the court says it's perfectly clear that, that there has to be some limit on the time allowed for ratification of amendments. Um, he went to the, to the archivist who said, what do you want me to do, right? <laughs> I'm the archivist, right? This thing is sent to me as ratified. Unless Congress tells me not to, I'm putting it in the Constitution. So Congress has the opportunity to vote, you know, no, we won't allow your amendment because we want to have the House Bank. Uh, I think a total of three members voted 
voted not to include this in the Constitution. And it became uh, uh, an amendment. Now, does it hurt things a lot? Probably not. Although the great irony is, in the episode we just lived through, where people began to say, damn, if Congress can't pass a budget, let's cut their salaries. Well, guess what? <laughs> can't do it because of the, of the 27th Amendment, which says no law varying the compensation, right? So that, you know, this populist anger that put it in there is then thwarted by it, right? Which suggests that maybe you should be careful about what you write into the Constitution. Um, and, uh, you know, the other thing that's disturbing is just to think that, just to see how much political subjectivity goes into the actual text of the Constitution, which we think of as as set apart. Um, this, is, this, was, this, this didn't have to happen that way. It's just contingent, and it had to do with members of Congress covering themselves from political fallout. But, but is there any vice in the ability to ratify after such a long period of time? Does that say anything about the stability of the rest of the document? Well, you know, it, 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 it has disturbing theoretical you know, parts of it. Why should something, you know, be open for ratification for three centuries, surely that could give rise to unintended consequences? F fortunately or unfortunately, the Constitution is so hard to ratify otherwise that there really only are about three or four other amendments that have ever been approved by Congress and have not been ratified. So it's not like we're in danger of this happening all the time. Right. Um, and what's fascinating about Article 5 is, you know, we think we live in a country where we the people, you know, yada yada, but Congress has almost complete control of the, of the amendment process. Nothing can get into the Constitution unless Congress approves it or agrees to call a constitutional convention. Mm -hmm. And Congress just, all Congress has to do is nothing and the Constitution stays the same. By the way, um, how many of you have seen the movie Lincoln? Um, and a dramatic part of that movie was when President Lincoln undertakes to sign the, thir the proposed 13th Amendment before it goes to the states. Did he have to do that? Did he have the right to do that, the power to do that? Uh, no, the, the, the president plays no role in the amendment process. And in fact, Lincoln, some people sort of, you know, at that point it was a little hard to talk back to Lincoln, but some people said, you really want to do this, and Lincoln was very excited. Uh, he had made the 13th Amendment a, a key part of his re-election in 1864, but no president prior to him had ever undertaken to sign um, a proposed amendment. The president plays no role in that process, uh, and it produced an embarrassment not very long after because Lincoln was assassinated, as we know, and then the 14th Amendment was passed, and as far as we can tell, President Andrew Johnson took, considered very seriously attempting to veto the 14th Amendment and not permit it to be submitted to the states. Um, what's fascinating about all this from the point of view of what we're talking about is that the text of the Constitution seems very clearly to say that the president should have the power to sign or veto. If you look at... Um, uh, the presentment clause? The presentment clause. It says every bill or resolution which shall have the form of a bill uh, to which the concurrence of both houses is required shall be presented to the president. Well, that describes a joint resolution which proposes an amendment. And there is nothing in the text that says the only thing that's accepted is, is laws that have to do with adjournment. So, you know, that exception's there. There's no exception for constitutional amendments. And I really dug on this one. Right, because I thought somebody must have explained why this is. And, you know, finally, you know, I just realized that David Curry, the great historian of the Constitution in Congress, just says, you know, it was never mentioned in the first Congress. Washington never sought to assert any role in the amendment process, uh, which meant that, you know, uh, the first 10 amendments went forward without his signature. And as a result of that decision, it is now the unbreakable custom that the president plays no role um, in, the, in the ratification uh, or proposal or ratification of amendments. Now, the only exception other than Lincoln, of course, was, uh, was Lyndon Johnson, whom we all think of, you know, in the same breath as Lincoln all the time. 
And uh, when the 25th Amendment was uh, proposed, he just wasn't about to waste the chance to have a big TV thing in the Rose Garden. And they kept saying, you know, Mr. President, this really is not uh, legal. You're not supposed to shut up. You know, shut up, George. I'm going to sign this guy. And then he had the people over there <laughs> signed it. But it really had no legal meaning whatsoever. Um, by the way, a little historic footnote. Um, during my journalism career, I had the opportunity twice to uh, conduct interviews with Lyndon Johnson. Oh, I um, one was in the bathroom off of the, uh, uh, the Oval Office, and one was in the outhouse on his branch. <laughs> um, yeah, well, we're now at your part of the program, yes. and so uh, um, you, some of you have uh, submitted questions, and, and we'll go through at least some of those. Um, um, and if, after, if we've completed that and there's a few minutes left, then we'll take some questions from the audience, if you like. First question is, um, the requirement to billet soldiers mm -hmm. reflects an archaic component of the Bill of Rights. Can that be used to understand and repeal or modify the Second Amendment? You know, the Third Amendment, the most successful amendment to the Constitution is the Third Amendment. There's just no doubt about it. And when you go home tonight, look around your home, and if you note the absence of uniformed military personnel <laughs> sleeping in your home, then thank the Third Amendment. Um, there's only been one case uh, ever decided under the Third Amendment that was won by a man named Alan Sussman in Bearsville, New York. Um, and I don't think it intercepts with the Second Amendment because, um, except as follows. Every now and then, every now and then, and in, my, in the state of Oregon where I lived for 16 years, this came up and was debated, uh, there was a proposal in the legislature to require every home to have a gun. Uh, we just felt that we would be much safer if everybody had weapons and could, could shoot each other at, at short notice. Um, and I think that that bill would violate the Third Amendment, even though it's not an actual soldier requiring you to have military weapons in the home, is getting pretty close to violating the Third Amendment. Beyond that, no. I think the Third Amendment is really about the home. It says, it says first of all, it doesn't say that troops can't be billeted in your home. They can be in time of war if Congress passes a law to allow it, right? And then there would be payment and so forth. Um, but, uh, but other than that, what other people do outside the home, I think, is not implied. And since the Second Amendment seems to contain some kind of right for individuals to own weapons, um, I don't see the two amendments as, as okay. conflating. Uh, does the, quote, sacredness, unquote, of the Constitution create problems for the country, particularly with regard to identifying deficiencies in the document and changing it so it better serves the people, that is, to amend it? Oh, I think absolutely. I think, I think that is a really striking part of modern American politics and governance that I think honestly was not seriously foreseen and certainly not intended at the time the document was framed. Uh, I think by and large the framers of the Constitution, you know, we have this image of them sitting across the mall and saying, you know, this Constitution will last for hundreds of years, right? <laughs> because they used F instead of S, as we all know. Um, and, and I don't think they thought that. I think they were working against time. They were really, really worried about the international situation, the domestic political situation. And most of them thought that if they could put something together that would last for 25 years and keep the country from falling apart and get the British out of the Ohio Valley and let us organize the, the uh, you know, Northwest Territory, it would be a tremendous success. And there's a wonderful exchange between Madison and Nathaniel Gorham of Massachusetts right at the end. Because Madison, you know, Madison's a fussy little guy. You know, I always tell my students to think if you wanted to cast the movie, you know, Constitution, the movie, Madison would be Rick Moranis. He's a little guy. And, he's in, and he, right at the end, he's saying, there's one thing we haven't done. We need a thing that says that, you know, you can't have uh, more, uh, you know, and, and people were saying, you know, let's have this many members of, of Congress uh, per thousand. And somehow it, the formula, if it was left in place, would have 
meant that today we'd have to have 3,500 members of the House, which is really frightening. So Madison's saying, we really need to address this. This is incomplete. And Gorham says, Grandpa, chill, right? He says, you don't really think that this Constitution will still be in effect 50 years from now. We'll have others. We'll work it out. We don't need to worry about this. Well, luckily, Madison insisted, right? Otherwise, we would have 3,500 members mm -hmm. of the House. Um, but, but the Constitution has taken on, within a generation or two, it took on this sheen, you know, of, of completeness, of sacredness. There's a wonderful quote from Lincoln when he was a member of Congress saying, saying, we must regard it as unfallible. Who can do better than they did? Because he was opposing an amendment to the Constitution. Um, so, and he was really speaking for a lot of people. So the result is that, that we have, you know, some really bad problems that very often we don't recognize as problems because they come out of the Constitution. And since we all know the Constitution is perfect, if the Constitution is causing us a problem, that must be a wonderful thing. Article 2 in the Electoral College, it's a great example, right? I mean, not only did it sort of almost, I mean, it did screw up in, in 2000. It almost screwed up in 2004, but it was very possible. People took very seriously the possibility that, you know, George W. Bush got to be president in 2000, even though he lost the popular vote. It was almost the case that John Kerry became, would become president in 2004, even though he lost the popular vote. Um, Article 2 just doesn't work. And we, America, because we think, oh, you know, the, the, the founding fathers. By the way, the, the term founding fathers, as probably people here know, was coined by that great thinker, Warren G. Harding. Um, and so we all, you know, really believe in the founding fathers. But, you know, the founding fathers understood, they coined, they put the Electoral College there to do whatever it is that we imagine that they put it in there to do. Um, and isn't it wonderful how it does it? And it actually is, a, it's, it's, we're sort of like, Reminds me of, you know, characters in a Three Stooges movie, you know, where the, the guy is standing there and the bucket keeps swinging back and forth and hitting him in the head and he never quite puts it together what's going on. It's like, and he, bam, and he, he's like, eh, he looks over here and the bucket comes here. And so, so yeah, you know, we, we have a little trouble thinking critically. And, of course, the Constitution is very hard to amend also. So that um, kind of discourages us from dealing with some of the problems that we have. Okay, let's, let's take a couple more. Yeah. Um, do, do Supreme Court decisions such as Citizens United, the Second Amendment gun case, and the court striking down the Voting Rights Act demonstrate that judicial review is a poor concept? <laughs> well, uh, you know, Jefferson sure thought so. Um, you know, go back. Uh, this is dispute broke out. You know, right after Marbury versus Madison, and and Jefferson for the rest of his life is writing these letters, saying, you know, where, you know, who, where did that come from? I, I don't get it. Um, and and certainly, I think you can make the case that over the two hundred plus years of our constitutional history, there have been a number of episodes where the Supreme Court has been very aggressive in using its power of judicial review in behalf of what we now think of as really not constitutional but policy grounds. The very first case of uh, judicial review of a federal statute, judicial invalidation of a federal statute, was Marbury. The next time the Supreme Court invalidated a federal statute was Dred Scott versus Sanford, in which the court held, you know, on very flimsy grounds that you know, slavery was in essence perpetual and African Americans could never be part of the American political community. Go forward then to the, to the Lochner era, to the era when the, the, the court is on the, uh, attempting to destroy the New Deal. We may be heading into a period of confrontation among the branches like that. You know, one of the things, uh, I wrote a piece about John Roberts recently and I said he seems poised to, you know, he, he's a, he is really a product of the Reagan era very loyal to, to Ronald Reagan's vision. And of course, Ronald Reagan's working thesis was government is not the solution, government is the problem. You can remember that from his first inaugural address. And, and I said John Roberts seems poised to protect America from the problem that is the voters. Uh, and so we, we may be heading for, for another period like the 30s or like the Lochner era. Uh, and historically, it, it's, it's very bothersome. And sometimes, you know, uh, 
Walter Dellinger was my con law professor, and we used to debate, would the country be better off if there was no power of judicial review, even if that meant no Brown versus Board of Education, might we still not be better off if it meant there was no Lochner, you know, no uh, uh, Hammer versus Dagenhart child labor case? It, of course, you never know. You can, that's the kind of thing academics dispute. But it is not 100% clear that the way our Supreme Court works uh, is the best possible way to run a country. All right, I'm going to give this as the last question. Um, <clears throat> Robin uh, didn't tell uh, Gareth this when we invited him here, but there is a trap door under here. And if we reach the hour at which Robin thinks we should conclude, that trap door opens and both the guest and the moderator are lost forever. Um, OK, this is our last question. I struggle to explain the Electoral College to my teenage children. Any advice? <laughs> <laughs> well, I would tell them it's a bad idea, <laughs> right? It was largely put in place to protect the slave states um, because uh, Madison says right there on the floor of the convention, the best way to elect the president would be to have the people do it. We all know that. But we can't do that because that would be bad for the slave states. That, that's a direct quote. Okay. Um, and uh, for that reason, uh, it doesn't do any of the things you're told that it does. It doesn't protect small states at all. Um, it doesn't cool the fire of democracy. It, it just introduces this kind of, we were talking about the Constitution as a machine, you know, it introduces this Rube Goldberg apparatus in the middle of it. It says, well, you put your vote in here, and, the, you know, and then the rat goes up here, and it gets the cheese, and if you're lucky, you get a president at the other end. So I would tell your teenage children, you know, you guys are young. Go change it. Well, then we're out of time, and we hope that uh, you haven't given up on us uh, earlier than this. Uh, but uh, on behalf of the center and Robin uh, and the leadership of the center, I am grateful that you came well, today. Thank you. Garrett, and I'm grateful that you came. Thank you. Good. And there, there will be a book signing down uh, at the gift shop yes. uh, if you're interested in Garrett's book. If not, I'll sign up. <laughs> People. Okay. Good. Thank you.